this is on. Okay. Hello. Okay. Good evening. On behalf of interim, on behalf of interim director Ingrid Bettencourt and the board of trustees, welcome to the Newark Public Library. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Tom Anker, the uh, supervising librarian of Charles F. Cummings New Jersey Information Center here at NGL. We are honored to be hosting this presentation of the Newark History Society. Through the 20 years of its existence, the History Society has been a valued partner for NGL. Hosting these events allows us to expose our users to interesting and protected programs about the city's history. And it helps us keep alive the spirit of my predecessor, Charles Cummings, the co founder of the Society. I just have a few housekeeping items uh, to go through. For those of you who haven't yet been some of the New York History Society has generously provided for this event and the tables are there. Um, uh, restrooms are out this door on the left. Uh, we ask that people hold their questions until the end of the presentation. We have microphones here in the hall who, uh, to ask questions and make comments. People watching on Zoom can type their questions and comments in the chat box or in the Q&A box. We will get to as many questions as possible after the presentation. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Aisha Marable, and I am the AVP of Community Engagement at New Jersey Performing Arts Center. It's truly an honor to be a partner at the History Society. I come tonight uh, just to share an acknowledgement and uh, that we are situated on land once inhabited by ancestors of the Ramapo and the Nantico Lenin Lenape. We honor them and the generations and souls who inhabited this land before. And we are grateful to Chief Dwayne Perry of the Ramapo Lape Munsi tribe and the Oleana Whisper, Eastern Zalagi Algonquin descendants for their generosity, their wisdom and labor to craft these following words. I am a Cherokee Indian, so I thought it not robbery to be fine to share these words. We were put upon this turtle island, not to seek dominion, but as caretakers. And we gather here in a good way, to be with the earth's children and all of their forms, those of the land, the water, and the air. We, the Lenape, original benefactors of the land, once ripened and cultivated with the attentiveness to the creator, and her ascendancy express everlasting gratitude to our creator for the traditional ancestral jurisdictions of the Munsi. Esophis, Canarsi, Capsi, Workos, Suwanoi, and the Weekwe, jointly known today as the Ramapo, the Natito, Lanai, Lanaka. We are the Lanape Poking today. And we will be, for the remaining days of our tomorrow, keepers of the past. Let this moment of recognition be the monument of action. Let it be the beginning of hope for this, our turtle island, and for the Ramapo Lenape, the Munsi people of those whose land we now try. Here on this land, in this place of the Munsi, we acknowledge our debt to those who have come before us, to those who have been denigrated and suffered for the sake of cultural and land appropriation. And let this, our land acknowledgement, be the beginning of our return to it. Let us be guardians of the water, the air, the earth, the four-legged, the flyers, the swimmers, the crawlers, the mammal, the people, and the green. Let us now stand lifting our humanity and rapturing the earthy, Earth's consciousness as guardians of harmony and kindness. And with that, let us receive our leader of this great year, Tim Chris.
Uh, thank you, Aisha. On a spring day in late May 1666, a band of Hackensack, members of the Muncie Lenape Nation, confronted a group of settlers uh, unloading their goods on the banks of the Passaic River just a couple hundred yards from here. Uh, Robert Treat, the leader of the settlers, recalled later that the Hackensack folks seemed troubled and angry that we landed any of our goods there. During this confrontation, the Hackensacks insisted that the land belonged to them and had not been sold. The settlers accepted that explanation, put their goods back on uh, their vessels again, and sailed back down to the say. With this talk, I want to explore what the historical record says about the relationship between the first settlers of Hillard and the Hackensack. How did the settlers view the Hackensack? How did they acquire the new tract? Was there ongoing conflict? What sort of continuing interactions were there between the settlers and the Hackensack? People have provided different answers, different interpretations of those questions over the last 200 years. And I thought, given those different uh, interpretations, that it made sense to go back to the historical document, to the documentary record, and take a fresh look. In um, 1835, when D.P. Pearson included an historical sketch in the first directory of Newark, he declared it must be satisfactory to every townsman to know that every foot of land within our bounds was honestly and openly purchased of its original proprietors. However unjustly the Aborigines may have been dealt with elsewhere, no act of our ancestors can be pointed to with the slightest reproach uh, by the most jealous advocate of Indian rights. Well, Pearson wrote this at a time when Andrew Jackson had forced the talk cause on the infamous Trail of Tears. And this statement is, is as much a statement of political opposition to Jackson as it was an exoneration of his ancestors. Uh, Eighty years later, as the celebration of Newark's children's 50th anniversary approached in, in 1960, uh, Frank Urquhart offered a similarly self-satisfied uh, interpretation. The men who founded Newark received the territory direct from the Indians, causing him to retire gradually to more and more distant points with constantly reducing matters. Here in Newark, as throughout all New Jersey, the Indian was paid the price he had for every foot of the land. Um, Urquhart's perspective likely informed the inscription placed on Gutson Borglum's first landing party of the founders of Newark, now on the grounds of uh, N.J. Pass, not that far from where the initial encounter uh, between the Hackensack and the first settlers took place in 1666. And you can see that Borglum carved a frieze at the top, um, that to represent the encampment of the uh, Hackensack. Although to me, it looks like there is a settler welcoming the Hackensack to the land rather than uh, vice versa. More recently, this comfortable 1916 view has been challenged. Uh, Kevin Munford asserted in his 2007 book about Newark that this rendering of Newark's history uh, conveniently er erased the uncompensated coercion of Native Americans. Uh, he didn't provide any basis for this conclusion, and as it uh, become clear as I go through this, I think he's wrong. Um, and a statement by the Price Institute uh, at Rutgers Newark in, in uh, a year or two ago reflects the perspective of present day Lenny Lenape. A Puritan Robert Treat claimed to own what became Newark. This was Muncie Lenape uh, land generously shared with the Connecticut migrants who occupied the unceded region. 
So given these contradictory views, I decided to take this fresh look at the documentary record, and I recognized the limitations to this approach, not least that all the surviving records from the colonial period were created by settlers for settlers, uh, since the Monkey Lenape did not have a uh, written language. And I also recognize that other disciplines besides it, archaeology, anthropology, landscape architecture, and envi environmental science have a great deal to add, and not, uh, and not least, uh, oral tradition. And together, they um, uh, help to make the field of Native American and indigenous studies so rich and so fruitful. The best example of this uh, combined approach that I'm aware of um, for New Jersey is this recent Our Land, Our Stories uh, project uh, with the Ramapo Lenape up uh, near Falwa. Um, also, Gene Soderland has done a recent study of, um, of uh, similar issues for South Jersey. Um, but my focus in reviewing the documentary record is, is different. I want to understand the perspectives and the actions of the first settlers of Newark um, as part of a larger research project that I'm uh, slowly working through about the early history of Newark. First, some background. Uh, there's a Canadian website called Native Lands, and it's, it's terrific because you can zero in on anywhere on the globe for their representation of uh, which indigenous groups were where um, uh, in, in uh, before encounters with uh, Europeans or other groups. Um, uh, this shows that the Munsi Lenape uh, territory was vast. Uh, it started from uh, Western Long Island and included uh, Manhattan, Staten Island, uh, went over through Northern New Jersey, past the Delaware River where the Minisinks were, uh, and up the Hudson River to about Kingston, where the Esophis tribe was uh, uh, located. The Hackensacks were a woodland tribe in in uh, uh, the northern part of east of the, the eastern part of northern New Jersey. Um, and what the Munsee lacked in uh, technological skills compared to the Europeans, skills like metal smithing. They more than made up um, in their knowledge of the natural environment and the ability to live in harmony with the land by fishing, hunting, gathering, and cultivating crops like corn, beans, and squash. In this slide, I have charted the population uh, over time in the 17th century of the Muncie, shown in the downward sloping red line and of European colonists, the upward sloping orange line uh, in New Jersey and New York, essentially what was the Muncie Lenape nation. And I've drawn on estimates of population uh, for the Muncie uh, from Robert Grummet's um, uh, book about the Muncie Lenape in 2009. He estimated that in 1609, when Henry Hudson and his crew sailed up the uh, river that was later named for him, uh, there were about 15,000 uh, Muncie Lenape in this vast area uh, of uh, northern New Jersey and up the Hudson Valley. Um, and for the next few decades, the Muncie outnumbered the colonists, um, but disease, war, and the growing settler population uh, took an awful toll. Uh, Muncie still outnumbered uh, colonists, uh, to the 1650s and kept them penned in a small area like uh, uh, the southern tip of Manhattan and a couple pockets uh, along the west bank of the, uh, of the Hudson River. Uh, by the time the English captured New Amsterdam from the Dutch in 1664 and renamed it New York, um, it's likely that the Muncie population had already declined to about 3,000. And at least one historian has suggested that they had likely, quote, already lost political control over the region. When the Newark settlers sailed up the Passaic in 1666, 
it was probably around the crossover point in terms of population and perhaps at the inflection point in terms of Muncie shaping their own long-term destiny in this area. 20 years later in the 1680s, uh, Settlers outnumbered Muncie again in New Jersey and New York by as much as 10 to one. And at the turn of the 18th century, Muncie may have numbered only about a thousand, a decline of about 95% in population in, in about uh, hundred years. Um, by 1666, uh, Muncie had gained experience dealing with the Dutch and the English uh, about the use and sale of lands, even if the transactions were likely subject to misunderstanding common uh, in negotiations between uh, uh, a party steeped in oral culture on one side and the other party accustomed to written contracts. And like other Native American tribes, Muncie held land in common, sometimes letting other groups uh, camp or plant or fish and hunt, so long as they respected the local customs and concerns. And that view of sharing the land probably informed the first uh, uh, several land transactions um, that the Hackensack Hack paid, such as uh, uh, in 1630 for Staten Island and parts of today's Jersey City. But I think it's likely that by the 1660s, they had gained a better understanding of how Europeans viewed land sales as final. Now, communal ownership of the land required communal decision-making about its possible sale. And this consultative approach was at work in uh, July 1663, when Governor Peter Stuyvesant of New Amsterdam approached Oratam, the most senior uh, sachem for the Hackensack, uh, uh, trying to acquire land for colonists from or settlers from New Haven Colony, um, including Robert Tree. About half of that group later, uh, three years later, did settle in uh, in uh, in what became newer. Um, Oratam did a very effective job of stalling uh, uh, Stuyvesant's request. He, um, through an interpreter, told Stuyvesant that he had not been able to speak with the young men of his tribe because they were out hunting and the old men did not want to sell, preferring to keep a portion for planting and not wanting, or so the, the record says, to quote, go further inland for fear of being robbed by their enemies. However, he left the door open for the future saying that there was land enough for both the colonists and the Hackensack. So three years later, Robert Treat and the first Newark settlers pushed on that open door. Uh, the confrontation with the Hackensacks on the banks of the uh, Passaic uh, no doubt surprised them because they had, I presume, asked Governor Carteret for assurances that he had cleared um, the land from, quote, all claims and encumbrances and therefore could give, uh, quote, quiet possession of the land. Um, in their negotiations with three years earlier with Governor Stuyvesant about establishing a settlement, Robert Treat and others had acknowledged um, explicitly with uh, in their communications with Stuyvesant that the um, uh, Hackensacks had both, quote, a natural and a civil right to the land. And at the time, they insisted on a deed of sale subscribed not just by the English and the Dutch, but also by, quote, the hands of those Indians who so owned it. Thus, it's clear that the Newark settlers uh, recognized Hackensack ownership of the land. I need to take a, uh, another step back and fill in some more background. Under the European doctrine of discovery, both here in New Jersey and elsewhere in the New World, um, Native groups, indigenous groups, retain title to their land uh, with a continuing right to occupy and use that land that could last in perpetuity if they did not consent to sell the land. 
but they could only sell their land to parties approved by the government that, uh, that claimed discovery. So in early New Jersey, that government um, was, uh, was represented by uh, Governor Philip Carteret. And that's why the first settlers had expected Carteret to have cleared the land from all, quote, all claims and encumbrances, or at least to have told them that they had his permission to negotiate with the Hackensack for the land. And I imagine that the Newark settlers were really frustrated when they had to put the goods back on their uh, on their vessels and sail back down the uh, the Passaic. They and other uh, uh, people from New Haven Colony uh, in the prior weeks had been down at the Delaware River uh, scouting out possible um, settlements along the Delaware for for most of New Haven Colony, and they had concluded that there was not an appropriate uh, uh, place uh, along the Delaware River. Um, about half the group that looked at the Delaware River went back to New Haven Colony, Treat and others uh, decided to uh, 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 look at this land that had been under negotiation with Stuyvesant three years earlier. Um, so, Rather than give up and go back to their homes in, in Connecticut, New Haven Colony, they decided with Carteret's encouragement to meet with the Hackensacks and see if they could negotiate purchase of the Newark tract. So Treat went with several other um, settlers along with interp an interpreter named John Captain to meet with Oratam and other sachems of the Hackensacks um, at a village up the Hackensack River. And during that meeting, uh, a Hackensack named Pero, P-E-R-R-O, laid uh, primary claim to to uh, to the Newark tract on behalf of his his uh, kindred, his, his family clan. Um, but he agreed to negotiating a sale. And then Robert Tree, who had gained a reputation for his skill in negotiating with native groups from his frequent contact with the Knipiaks in um, New Haven Colony, reached an agreement with Oratam to hold a second meeting uh, with a group of sachems, this time on the land in present day Newark, to discuss a possible sale. Now, Oratam didn't take part in that second meeting uh, because he was too ill to travel. And Robert Treat right, uh, later recalled at the end of the 1680s that. Soon after they came, that is, Paro and his kindred with the Sagamores, that is, the Sachems, that were able to travel, Oratum being very old, but approved of Paro's action. At this second gathering um, in present-day Newark, uh, Paro confirmed that the Newark tract had not been sold to anyone else, and the Hackensack leaders agreed with uh, the Newark settlers on the boundaries and terms for a sale of the land. Samuel Edsel, a uh, Dutch interpreted, facil uh, interpreter, facilitated the negotiation. Now, we don't have any details on the offers and counter offers during that negotiation session, but it likely took a few days and required generous amounts of food and drink to reach a, an initial agreement. Um, this process of trust building was an important element of the negotiation. And for example, 10 years later, uh, Philip Carteret negotiated with the Navasinks for a, a, some land along the uh, Raritan River. And he incurred substantial expenses on that occasion for providing food and drink at four different negotiation sessions. And I presume something like that occurred in the negotiation for this trial. Now, as was the custom, the deed of sale was confirmed and signed a year later uh, after, quote, enlarging and perfecting the term. Um, and it was signed or agreed to by 10 sachems uh, listed there on the right, um, uh, headed by Wapamuk, who may have been a leader of the Navasings. And several other of the sachems may also have represented other groups, 
like the Raritans or the Navasin. Um, but the deed calls them, quote, Indians belonging now to Hackensack. Over on the left there, you can see in the uh, text at the bottom, on the fourth line, it says, Kirwin, uh, the Sachem of Pau. And some people have, declined, uh, have uh, suggested that that was another name for Pero, uh, whose uh, family had been kindred had been in this area. Um, so he was one of the witnesses, along with Samuel Edsel, noted in the third line, and two or three others who, who uh, 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 signed it with their marks. The five settlers who signed this deed are listed in the middle, led by Obadiah Bruin, who was from New London. Uh, Micah Tompkins, John Brown, and Robert Dennison were all from Milford. And Samuel Kitchell, who's listed in the middle there, the third line, was from Guilford. And they signed, quote, in behalf of the inhabitants now being or to be the possessors of the tract of land uh, that was inserted and described in this deed of sale. And elsewhere in the deed, they are described as townsmen and agents for the English inhabitants of the say. And these men um, likely also provided much of the capital that was necessary to acquire the land with the stipulation that the other settlers would uh, reimburse them over the next few, year, few years through a town tax. Now this written deed, uh, of course, was for the use of the settlers. The Hackensacks would have communicated uh, or transmitted the agreement orally. And if they created a wampum belt to document it, it, it hasn't survived. Um, in the deed of sale, uh, the settlers were careful to refer to the Hackensack as the true owners of the land, or as they put it, the true proprietors. And in another place, the known acknowledged proprietors of the land. Now, by emphasizing that the Hackensacks had original title to the land, the Newark settlers were uh, assuring themselves that the Hackensacks had standing to transfer clear title, which is what they wanted. Um, and thus, while the, the deed notes that the sale took place with the consent and advice of Governor Carteret, which was necessary under the doctrine of discovery, uh, the Newark settlers believed their title to the land and sold it from the, uh, the purchase, not from Carteret's assignment. They did not involve Carteret in the negotiations for the purchase price, nor did they bother to have the deed of sale witnessed by him, as was certainly later the custom. And indeed, they waited eight years to, um, uh, before entering the deed in the official records uh, uh, kept by Carteret's government. And that's what this is. This is the deed as entered in the proprietary records in, uh, in uh, 1675, and this is down in the now, the Newark tract encompassed uh, the area from Laquay Creek or Bound Creek on the south to Watchonger First Mountain on the west, Yanacaw Brook or Third River on the north, and of course the Passaic River on the, uh, on the east. And so those lands today include Newark, Irvington, much of the oranges, Maplewood, uh, Montclair, Glen Ridge, Bloomfield, Belleville, and Nutley. And under the terms of this deed, uh, Newark settlers secured uh, use of the land and its timber and its mineral resources, hunting and fishing rights, and free range for their cattle, horses, and hogs, even if they strayed beyond the boundaries of the tract. Um, all Hackensacks retained fishing rights in the Passaic River. And those who had been encamped on the land before the sale retained hunting rights um, in the, on the Miller's tract. In addition, the Hackensack stations negotiated compensation consisting of a variety of goods, and ammunition, and alcohol that they could distribute among the different family groups and clans or use for trading with other indigenous groups. And note also at the bottom the large amount of wampum, the de facto currency uh, for trade at that period. The Newark settlers delivered 850 fathoms, 
I'll fathom is, is six feet long, or about 360 uh, beads or shells. Um, so that is more than 5,000 feet of wampum, nearly a mile of wampum uh, was part of the uh, uh, the purchase price. In my view, uh, it does not appear that the Hackensacks were coerced into relinquishing their title to the North Track, although they likely negotiated from a position of weakness. And why they proceeded with the sale of the Newark Track is not clear. And my best guess is they wanted good relations with the English following the displacement of the Dutch two years earlier. What does seem clear is that Newark settlers were highly motivated buyers. Uh, Governor Carteret, for one, thought the Newark settlers uh, agreed to a price that was much too high. Um, in his opinion, they paid more than four times the value of the land. Now, the deed of sale explicitly refers to Hackensacks who were living on the Upper Comp when the settlers first arrived. And where was that? What I've taken here is this famous uh, 19th century map, which has the streets of the day overlaid on the outline of the home box in the first land distribution. Um, the actual phrase referring to those who were um, uh, living on the land is liberty of hunting for the above said proprietors that were upon the upper commons. And the term proprietors was defined in the deed as the Indians belonging now to Hackensack, the known acknowledged proprietors of the tract. Now in 1670, uh, about 30 months after the deed of sale was uh, confirmed, uh, the town records listed seven common areas um, in uh, Newark. And look at number six. Um, that which lies against Aaron Blatchley's and John Ward, which I've outlined at the top, the, uh, in yellow, John Ward and Aaron Batch Blatchley, and then outlined in the red triangle, uh, what is now Harriet Tubman Square, or Washington Park, it used to be Washington Park, just on the other side of the street here. Um, and in my view, this strongly suggests that, um, the Hackensacks in 1666 were encamped on today's Harriet Tubman Square. Um, and uh, it wasn't called the, uh, the Upper Commons again after the land deed that I've been able to find until the very late 18th century when it took on the, uh, the uh, what's called the Upper Commons again. But by turning this map 90 degrees so the north is at the top, this is the one common area uh, designated in 1670 uh, that is at the, uh, could be on the upper end. So I think the, uh, the evidence is very strong that the Hackensacks were in camp on Harriet Tubman Square on the other side of the street when they confronted the, uh, the settlers unloading their goods in 1666. And there, that's not a surprise. I've circled the supposed landing spot. It's basically where the FBI building is now. Uh, it's no surprise that the Hackensacks would have heard the commotion and the activity from um, the unloading of goods um, a few hundred yards away. Uh, Newark settlers tried um, at least a couple times over the next decade to make additional land deals with the Hackensacks. Uh, they failed once, then they succeeded once. In August 1674, the uh, Newark Town Meeting formed a committee to treat with the, uh, quote, to treat with the Indians about a Quokkanonk, or as they defined it in the town records, that tract of land as lieth above our town by the river. Um, but the committee failed to reach an agreement, and several years later, the sachem Captain, one of those who had signed the land deed back in 1667, sold the Apokonok tract, which comprises today's Passaic and Clifton, to a consortium of Dutch settlers instead. Uh, the Newark settlers were really upset by this, and they claimed to have been, quote, hindered and deprived but it was probably their own unwillingness or lack of resources to meet the demands of the Hackensacks that prevented the acquisition. 
And their failure, of course, had lasting repercussions, not only for the size of Newark, but for the eventual boundary between Passaic and Essex counties. They had more luck in 1678 uh, when, quote, after much debate, they voted in the town meeting to negotiate with the Hackensacks for the land from the base uh, of First Mountain, which is where the original tract ended, up to the top of First Mountain. Um, about seven square miles along that long north-south um, uh, line. Um, in this case, negotiations went quickly. The vote took place on, on March 1st, and by March 13th, uh, Winoxop and Shinoctos, quote, Indians and owners of the said Great Mountain, agreed to the deed of sale with John Ward and Thomas Johnson, who were the justices of the peace for Doric at the time, um, in the presence this time of, of Governor Carteret. And a short time later, John Treat and John Curtis met with the Hackensacks to run the west line of the purchase. And Edward Ball and Daniel Dodd did the same thing for the north line of the uh, boundary. And the two groups met on First Mountain. Uh, together with Hackensack to mark the new uh, boundary. And I guess I should add that in 1699, when Newarkers acquired land on the other side of First Mountain, uh, you know, the Caldwell, Short Hill, Milburn, and such, um, the East Jersey government had outlawed direct line, land purchases from indigenous groups, so the Newarkers negotiated with the proprietors instead at that point. Um, Hackensacks uh, continued to live on the Newark tract for at least the next couple decades after the Newark settlers arrived, although their presence declined rapidly toward the end of the 17th century. They retained plots of land for planting, as well as the right to hunt and fish. And well away from the Newark home lots, uh, they had an encampment known to settlers as the uh, Paro's campsite, or on uh, on this map, uh, formed uh, 15, 17 years ago by Charles McGrath when he plotted out the land distribution's uh, chief Paros campsite. And that uh, campsite was located on today's uh, uh, Monte Irvin Orange Park uh, between those two uh, streets or two paths. And just as with Tubman Square, uh, the land of Paros campsite was not allocated to the settlers when they distributed land to each other. Um, um, you can see there was also a Paro Street, uh, which recalled Paro, spelled differently, P A R R O W, right below uh, uh, Route 280 in, uh, in Orange. Um, Charles McGrath, in his work, and more recently George Musser, who's been plotting the uh, the land distribution in Bloomfield and Montclair have identified a number of indigenous sites that were named in, in those land deeds. For example, there were at least two wigwam brooks, um, one in today's West Orange, and that's still called Wigwam Brook, and the other in Upper Montclair between today's Alexander and Mount Hebron uh, avenues, um, and that's no longer called Wigwam Brook. Uh, on on Macapin Road there, well, into the 18th century, there was a plot called Macapie, uh, which may have been a Muncie name for pumpkins. There may have been a continuing planting uh, ground um, uh, in that area of, of Upper Montclair for a, a considerable period. Um, the first settlers of Elizabethtown um, feared uh, that they might be um, uh, well, they feared for their safety as long as they were outnumbered by um, uh, indigenous people. So they urged the first settlers of Newark to establish their far, uh, first farms near them um, in today's Waquaic section. Um, and into the uh, 1680s, encounters between the Hack and Sacks and the settlers were frequent enough, likely due to regular trade and goods, that Newarkers learned enough of the Muncie language to converse and make deals. For example, Jonathan Titchener, who was a young boy when Newark was settled, recalled in old age that, quote, in his younger years, he could understand and talk 
the Indian language. Once the uh, Newarkers secured title to the land, uh, they asserted their property rights and enforced their own rules and customs on the Hackensacks uh, regarding livestock and trading goods and the sale of alcohol. And by taking these steps, the, uh, the Newarkers fit well the academic definition of settler colonists. Uh, the definition that I find useful is settler colonialism is different from other forms of colonialism in that settlers come with the intention of making a new home on the land, a homemaking that insists on settler sovereignty over all things in the new domain. And with that, the, the, uh, in an act of erasure, the Newark settlers uh, uh, did not retain the Muncie terms for geographical and, and natural uh, formation. Uh, certainly, the Passaic was retained for uh, for the river. Uh, Watsessing or Watsessing is one name that has persisted um, throughout the century. But the other names like Bequake and Yantaka and Wachung were um, um, reintroduced at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, mostly through the Essex County Parks Commission. And they knew those names because they had been noted in the land deed back in 1667. And the uh, Essex County Park Commission also ran kind of a competition or sought public input in 1925 on what should be the name of the parkway that runs between East Orange and Irvington. And the uh, the public supported naming that Boratin Parkway, which is named after uh, Boratin, the, uh, the uh, Hackensack stage. And over the centuries uh, before the arrival of the Dutch and the English, uh, uh, the Muncie Lenape had established a, a network of trails and paths throughout the territory. And many of these were turned by the settlers into streets, uh, such as today's Washington Street, on the other side of the wall here, um, South Orange Avenue, the old road to Bloomfield, River Road up to uh, Belleville, um, Valley Road in Montclair, uh, Elizabeth um, um, Avenue in the Wequaig section were all Indian trails or paths. Um, the Northfield Avenue, Bloomfield Avenue, Route 3 that go through the notches in First Mountain were also um, followed um, uh, paths that have been established by Native groups over the uh, centuries. Um, throughout New Jersey, um, and here in what became Newark, relations between indigenous people and the settlers were tinged with suspicion and occasionally morphed into fear, um, at least among the settlers. And the fact that settlers and indigenous groups did not engage in skirmishes after the creation of New Jersey, in my view, is, is do much more to the restraint of the Hackensacks and others than to uh, reluctance by the settlers. On at least eight occasions uh, in the first 15 years after Newark was settled, Newarkers went on high alert and, and um, uh, uh, prepared to defend their town from possible attack. And the the real uh, the highest point of concern was during King Philip King Philip's War. In 1675 and 1676, when reports came from Massachusetts and Rhode Island that about half the towns had been um, attacked and a third of the, those New England towns had been abandoned due to the, uh, 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 the conflict in King Philip's War. So in August 1675, the, um, the Newark settlers. Uh, voted to uh, fortify uh, the meeting house. And then in the following January, um, they took further steps to strengthen fortifications belonging uh, to the town. And these steps continued through 1681. But again, there, at least in the historical record, um, there are no examples of actual skirmishes or battles um, between the settlers and the Hackensack. And by 1684, uh, Deputy Governor Galvin Lowry um, could write, perhaps hopefully, 
to the Scots proprietors of East Jersey that they quote, there are but few Indian natives in the country. Their strength is inconsiderable. They live in the woods and have small towns in some places far up in the country. Um, I was surprised that there's no evidence of missionary activity in the uh, first year by the Newark settlers uh, among the Hackensack. Because Abraham Pearson, the first minister of, of uh, Newark, had been one of the leading missionaries in New England. Um, he had published in 1658, this is two or three years before John Eliot's uh, Bible, um, a catechism called Some Help for the Indians, which was interlineated in English and the Kirapi, uh Eastern Algonquian language. Um, and he uh, rode 100 mile circuits of what were called Indian towns in uh, Connecticut and New Haven colony as often as eight times a month. And he was supported in this effort while uh, minister of the Brantford Church. But he was supported in these additional efforts by the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in New England. Um, but again, there's no record that he undertook this uh, when he got to um, Newark in late 1667. And it may have been that the because the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel was more than paying him, um, but it may also be, he really suffered from kidney stones in that area. And you can imagine just how painful that would have been for him to, um, um, to travel. Um, but Newark has retained a strong interest in both sending the gospel to the Indian tribes, uh, get to the bottom there. Uh, for example, in 1796, when the New York Missionary Society was organized, um, uh, Alexander McWhorter, the longtime minister of uh, the Presbyterian Church in Newark, was the one who preached the sermon at that organizational meeting. Um, in 1963, James Baldwin commented that, quote, American history is longer, larger, more various, more beautiful, and more terrible than anything anyone has ever said about it. And I think that also fits Newark. Uh, Newark history is longer, larger, more various, more beautiful, and more terrible than anything anyone has ever said about. And that's our effort in the Newark History Society to explore those different aspects um, as we've been doing for the last 20 years. So what can we learn from the documentary record about the relationship between the first settlers of Newark and the Muncie Lenape in the late 17th century? Well, the short answer is not as much as we would hope. If only early court records had survived, we could learn about how the settlers in Hackensack's word worked through um, incidents that caused friction. We know that they set up a mechanism for dealing with these disputes, but we don't know how it worked in practice. And if only Governor Carteret's minute book um, uh, from the first years of the province had survived and more of his correspondence with the proprietors had survived, uh, we would know, we might know as much about his um, uh, negotiations with the different um, uh, indigenous groups as we do about the Dutch, the earlier Dutch period. Um, but we do know that Carteret was frustrated that he did not have a larger supply of goods that he could, quote, present to the Indian kings or sachems, um, which slowed his efforts to establish contact. And 1666, just a few months after the, uh, the confrontation on the Passaic, Carteret pleaded with the proprietors to send him a supply of gunpowder, ammunition, and trade goods noting about the native groups, quote, they are much affected and drawn on by trade. And in some cases, the absence of documents can convey important insights. There are no records of either settler on native assault or uh, native on settler assault uh, for Newark in this period. And despite the frequent uh, 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 Suspicions among the settlers, particularly during King Philip's War, again, there is no record of skirmishes or battles um, in Newark in this period. And I think that underscores the peaceful reputation of the Hackensack. 
But the Newark town records uh, survive, as does some correspondence of early settlers with their families back in Connecticut. Most of the land deeds survive because, of course, they were the most important documents in the eyes of the uh, settlers since they needed them to prove their title to the property. Um, so we can learn some important things. The Newark settlers arrived at a time when the Hackensacks had been ravaged by disease and greatly reduced in number in the face of colonial expansion. Four attempts soon died uh, after 1666, and I think it's likely that Pero died within the next decade. Uh, we learned that settlers recognized ownership of the land by the Hackensacks, but not, and this is crucial, their continuing sovereignty uh, over the area. Uh, settlers could not be sure that Hackensacks would agree to sell a tract of land because on at least a couple of occasions, the uh, negotiations failed. And when they did take place, it took time for the two sides to build trust to agree on boundaries and terms. Permission to negotiate had to be um, uh, secured in advance. In, the, in, the, in um, the case of the Hackensacks from a senior sachem like Oratam, uh, and from the group then actually living on the land, uh, and from Governor Carteret for the settlers. Agreements for land sales had to be confirmed by leaders of other groups. Um, in Newark's case, the Navasinks and the Raritan, um, at least early on. Uh, compensation was provided in forms that could be divided among the different groups, the different families, or that could facilitate future trade. Uh, the boundaries for any land sale were set jointly by representatives of indigenous and settler groups. Uh, and we know that Samuel Harrison, for example, was among those, quote, sent by the people of Newark to go with the Indians to mark out the boundary of the original purchase. And a land transfer did not become final for a full year, after which the two parties met again uh, with interpreters present to confirm the terms and to confirm that compensation had been paid. We also learned that there, there were continuing interactions between the two groups, uh, primarily for trade. Sometimes settlers would go to the Hackensack or Raritan encampments to engage in trade, for perhaps out to Perils campsite or other places where Hackensacks had their planting ground. And sometimes the Hackensacks would come to the settlers perhaps in today's uh, Laquaic area. The interactions were extensive enough that settlers learned at least some version of the Muncie language. I mentioned Jonathan Titchener earlier, but Ebenezer Lindsley, who came to Newark as a two-year-old, also claimed in later life that, quote, he pretty well understood the Indian language. However, the settlers in the Hackensack lived mostly separate existences. The settlers quickly built a fence around their town, both for defense and to control their livestock. And uh, native groups apparently mostly stayed away from the town. Uh, Joseph Harrison could recall uh, decades later, the time when he was a teenager, that he saw, quote, a number of Indians pass through Newark on their way to Elizabethtown and then returned to the town a few days later. Uh, perhaps it was the delegation of Hackensacks who had come down the, uh, the path, now the River Road in Belleville, uh, along the Passaic River, along, on their way to meet with Governor Carteret in Elizabethtown. Uh, but if that had happened frequently, and I think that uh, it would not have stood out in Joseph Harrison's memory. Uh, or seemed remarkable to him. So all that said, the settlers uh, apparently paid the most attention uh, and the most respect to the Hackensacks when they wanted to acquire land or feared attack. Once they secured the land, the settlers imposed their own traditions for how the land would be subdivided, how it would be farmed, uh, what geographic place names would be used, and what laws and customs would take precedence. Along with European settlers everywhere or elsewhere, 
the first settlers of Newark assumed that their civilization, their religion, and their culture were superior. And I'm grateful to Aisha for reading N.J. Pack's land acknowledgement at the beginning of this program. When you're ready, just even as we seek new historical insights about the first settlers of Newark and their relationship with the Muncie Lenape by searching for other documents and asking fresh questions of the, uh, the documents that we know about. We can benefit from the challenge expressed in that land acknowledgement through, quote, acknowledge our debt to those who have come before us, to those who have been denigrated and suffered for the sake of cultural and land appropriation, and to stand lifting our humanity as guardians of harmony and kindness. Thank you. So we will take questions from people here in the room, but we also have a couple of questions online. One question, JD was, uh, he says, or she, she says, what was Phillips for it? I think Phillips for yeah. uh, He asked, uh, this person asked, was that the French New Deal? Can you explain a little bit of the background? <laughs> yeah, King, Phil King Phillips War is, is actually, uh, as a percentage of the population, then uh, 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 both the uh, the uh, settler groups and the various uh, native groups in uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, part of Connecticut, and such, was the um, uh, had the highest casualty rate of any American war. Um, something like half of the United towns in New England were attacked. Uh, it was. Uh, uh, some 30 towns were abandoned, and um, there were, um, it led to some pretty vicious fighting on both sides. Uh, the native groups um, led by uh, a, a man who was called King Philip, he was, um, I think, from the Rhode Island area, maybe in Um uh, Really took the advantage, uh, the lead early on, and it caused uh, uh, um, uh, real panic among the colonists. So it's one of the more important wars. Those reports um, came down to the settlers in Newark, and, and that's why they uh, they got worried. But that took uh, a couple of years. The colonists did win, or, or uh, that war, and it led. Um, and other Indian groups like the uh, Mohegan and others stayed out of it. Um, but the colonists uh, uh, sent the uh, captured uh, Native Americans in that war off to slavery, off uh, down to Barbados and such. And even some of the so-called praying towns where John Elliott and others had tried to uh, protect uh, during this conflict, the emotions ran so high among the uh, the colonists that, uh, uh, in many cases, even those um, Native Americans who had agreed to live in the so-called praying towns were were caught up, and some were put on an island in the middle of Boston Harbor without much uh, resources. It's really an important chapter in American history that's getting an awful lot more attention because it it's a demonstration not only of the uh, the colonists' views, but the efforts, the continuing efforts by uh, Native American groups to challenge the settlements, uh, 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 the European settlements in that area. But that was in 1675, 1676. The French and Indian War was in the 1750s. Um, I have like a whole bunch. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you. Uh, great presentation. I have like a whole bunch of questions, so. Um, I, well, okay, the first question is, well, I guess I could look this up in, but where does the wampum come from that makes it such a valuable currency? It seems like it's kind of like it's a, a shell. It's carrot a, it's, shell. It's a clam shell. Okay. I believe it's a clam shell, small one, and, and the color uh, at various points had different um, uh, values. Uh, John Winthrop Jr., the governor of Connecticut, reported uh, to the Royal Society in London that the uh, 
that the white shells had a value six shells to a penny, whereas the purple or black uh, shells had, you know, was one shell to a penny. And then after a while, it took on whatever value that the two parties had, uh, agreed on in the negotiation. There was no currency circulating in, in among native group or the uh, the colonists in this period, and wampum became this de facto uh, currency for a, for a considerable period. Because yeah, because um, I thought that was interesting because in um, Africa and India, you have carry shells, and they serve a similar purpose. They also serve divination. Yeah. My other uh, two quick questions was just about when do you see your last record of um, the indigenous camping sites in Harriet Tubman Square? And then can you say a little bit more about the fishing rights of the Passaic? So I'm just kind of trying to understand, and maybe I think you already expressed it, like how exactly where the Hackensack eventually pushed totally out. So if we imagine yeah. them living in the Harriet Seven Square, we imagine them still utilizing the Passaic for fishing rights. But I, I don't think, uh, Noel, that after 1666 or 1667 that they continued to camp there. Um, they, they retreated further uh, west. Um, uh, in terms of the fishing rights, uh, uh, you're getting past my much of my knowledge, but there were uh, weirds uh, up near the Great Falls that were popular uh, spots for native groups to kind of set traps for fish coming down the uh, uh, the Passaic River, and that was a favorite fishing spot. Um, there, it's the archaeological evidence, which I'm not at all skilled in interpreting, is difficult for Newark because. Everything was built over and disturbed uh, the land. Uh, as best I've seen, the archaeological sites in Essex County tend to be out in in the western part of the county, the, the Horse Neck area, um, and that was where the Hackensacks were kind of um, in the 1740s, 1750s. That was where. The, those who were remaining tended to camp out in the Horse Neck area, in the Cold Road. Um, but I also suspect that the colon, they were just invisible to the colonists and, and continued to exist in the area. Certainly the Ramapo and uh, as I understand it, tended to collect a number of, of those who, who remained. The, those, the Muncie Lenape retreated in the mid 18th century or went up to join the Six Nations in upstate New York. Um, and uh, local legend is the last um, Indian was Indian gone in 1761. And again, I assume that they were still around, but it's not visible. Really Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't know much about that, Noel, but if there were, um, if you look at Charles McGrath's map, uh, there, he plot some of those areas out in the Maplewood area where there was some, but uh, so, uh, another question here about the wampum. I think you've kind of answered this, but I'll just ask this Dan O'Flaherty. Uh, what did the Hackensack want the wampum for? Were other Native Americans the only ones they intended to trade with? And why didn't they ask for some form of European money? I think you answered why they weren't. Yeah, there was no European money to, to speak of, Dan. And uh, it was kind of a... Uh, uh, I think the currency uh, worked both with other indigenous groups and with uh, other colonists as a as a uh, uh, form of of, of money uh, for trade when it was not barter. Um, uh, you know the, the Newark settlers when they were supposed to pay a, a half penny per acre quit rent to the Jersey government, they didn't have any money, so that they would deliver the market value of 
wheat or corn or, or whatever, or pork or whatever else they had to try to meet that, uh, uh, that, um, uh, requirement. Um, but no, there was no European currency circulated to speak of, uh, at least in this area, in Newark, in, in that period. Yeah, Hassani or the list? Uh, I just uh, noted that I think it's very poignant that that some board was inscribed under the Indian, uh, the Indian as if a collective of art. I know. And I wonder, are you familiar with the founder's monument that's in? Fairmont, Fairmont. Fairmont on Central Avenue. Um, it was in the church that the people came in the church. Uh, they did in a lot of the church. But they supposedly had determined who were the leaders of the party that turned those and they would have gotten that from the land yeah. Yeah. and then on the top of the statue of course was a, a wonderful statue of Robert Tree and it is in Fairmont Cemetery on Central Avenue. As a matter of fact, when you're you know, coming into 280, uh, you can look out towards your right and you can see the, the monument in the, the back of the cemetery. It was uh, at First Presbyterian for quite a while and it was totally falling apart. And the Landmarks Committee uh, made for the renovation of the statue. First, I have to say that that your research is incredible. It's so much information that I did not know about this area. Uh, but I, I do have a question. Uh, part of my family is similar. That has not a whole lot to do with the question, but uh, it, it is most most of the native people did not believe that anyone could own the land. It didn't belong to anyone. So they were basically say, I guess you could say in modern terms, leasing the land. They were letting people be paid for use yeah. of the land. Yeah. And it's just like the whole story, what is it supposed to be the Brooklyn Bridge or Brooklyn they sold the beans and everything. People didn't really understand what that was about. I was just wondering in your research, did that pop up anywhere where, where anybody understood that this was just, a, you know, I'm letting you use the land. And I'm not giving it to you because I don't own it myself. Yeah, yeah, that's the um, the uh, um, continuing uh, interpretive challenge. Certainly, the first transactions appear to have been very much on that basis. That that yeah, we're going to let you use it, and you're paying us something, and uh, and in effect, I understand that Staten Island was was sold three times, I mean, per, you know, essentially leased three times. Um, uh, as I go through it, uh, and I may be wrong on this, and this may be controversial, I tend to give uh, a fair amount of agency to the, uh, to the Hackensacks and others in uh, learning how the Europeans viewed it. The Europeans wanted a final sale. Um, so, and I would distinguish between, um, land and sovereignty. And I think that in this case, the Hackensacks, um, were willing to sell the land, but I think they felt they retained sovereignty. And the settlers did not recognize that. Um, so when the Price Institute says, uh, uh, Unseated land, CED, um, and as it's in the Tubman Square uh, monument, I think it reflects that view, and I may be wrong, I can't speak for the monkey, um, uh, that, that sense of continuing sovereignty over the land, um, that we didn't give that up, 
we just let you uh, gave up this land. We have another question online from Dan Caslow. Um, in your map of Muncie, there is a reference to a tribe on the lower left as Lenny Lenape, term that is no longer used. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, Dan, uh, you and I can talk about this the next time we have lunch, but I, um, I will defer to um, this uh, Native Land website, which is used by Native groups as well as um, um, uh, non-native um, uh, researchers and is kept current by a community of, of folks and they have uh, uh, continued to use the uh, uh, Lenny Lenape. One of the challenges is that in the 17th century, nobody referred to anybody by Muncie. And uh, Muncie was a term first used in about the third, uh, uh, into the 18th century. And Lenny Lenape was not used until even later in the in the 18th century, as I understand it. So uh, any of the records refer to Hackensack. They refer to Raritans. They refer to Minnesins. They refer to um, Raritans. Um, they don't refer to the Muncie Lenape. They don't refer to the Lenny Lenape because those terms were not used in that period. It, it is a later way of referring uh, in a collective way to the different indigenous groups in this area. So it gets confusing about what the appropriate uh, uh, term is. And, and if I'm wrong, I apologize, but uh, 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 at this point, uh, I'll continue to defer to, native, to the native land uh, uh, website. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that you had a list of sort of different things that early settlers would do to protect themselves, like carrying guns to church and whatnot. Yeah. Are there just no records at all of any altercations that, I mean, carrying guns to church, everything's fine? I'm just confused on that early 10 years. I'd love to know if it just... I, I have not come across any record, and I think that had there been a... Um... Uh, a skirmish or an altercation that would have showed up. Uh, for example, uh, in another town record, they're demanding that, uh, call it a posse, they didn't say that, but that efforts be made to track down those, the, the robbers, for example. So there was, there was that. But they felt vulnerable on a, on a Sabbath, on a Sunday service, because everybody was in the church and, um, or in the meeting house rather on Broad Street on the other side of where Old First is now. And so in a couple of these instances, they would put sentries out or ask a few uh, people to come and, and pay attention. But they felt vulnerable when the entire community was in the same place at the same time. Um, you know, we may find records of, of skirmishes. Um, but I've looked at the Elizabethtown records don't survive. I've gone through all of Woodbridge's records. I've gone through all the proprietary records for the period, and I have not found uh, a reference to that. I've looked at the uh, the laws that were passed um, uh, in, in that period by the General Assembly. Uh, there were certainly restrictions at times of heightened uh, 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 concern about uh, uh, for example, in one period, the, the blacksmiths were ordered not to repair any uh, any guns for uh, for the uh, the different uh, um, uh, Native American group. Um, but uh, in the Hackensacks had a reputation. Oriton had a reputation as a peacemaker. He, um, as I understand it would play kind of an intermediary role between the Esipus up the Hudson River and the Dutch uh, in conflicts up there. So it's not inconsistent with the record uh, in other instances, but uh, maybe there maybe something will turn up. James will James Omnamasa will find the, the record for me that I that I need going through them. And I want to congratulate you for bringing perhaps the youngest participant to uh, to a newer history society event and one of the best behaved <laughs> uh, over our hundred programs. 
So there's a question from Stephanie Daniels. Um, I realize this talk is specific to Newark and appreciate it, beautiful and terrible as it is. Uh, I'd love to know if anyone has done this type of work in Jersey City's first settlement. All us folks are going. Yeah, I, uh, you know, Jean so uh, Soderland has done it for South Jersey, but I, you can't get a whole picture for North Jersey or East Jersey without looking at Elizabethtown, but even more importantly, looking at um, uh, um, Paulus Hook, other places, Jersey City up in the Bergen, um, and the interactions with the Dutch in the um, decades before that. And there are some, uh, terrifying, um, uh, incidents in the, uh, the 1640s when a Dutch, uh, commander, uh, led a massacre. Uh, and then in 1655, the Muncie took, brought hundreds of, of warriors down the Hudson in canoes and, and, uh, and attacked settlers on Staten Island and along, uh, uh, the Hudson. So the richer, fuller period needs to um, uh, 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 research needs to really take advantage of Bergen and Hudson County, and to some extent Elizabethtown, although those records are hard to find. And I hope somebody does it, because that would really help to put Newark in a larger context. Well, in 1662, the group of settlers went to the say for what? That's the one I mentioned 1662. I mentioned 1663 uh, that uh, Robert Treat and uh, I think it was John Gregory on behalf of New Haven Colony negotiated with Governor Peter Stuyvesant about uh, acquiring a tract of land. It's unclear whether it was a newer tract or another one um, to uh, establish um, a new uh, outpost, new colony, since New Haven Colony was under uh, terrific stress. It did not get its charter. Uh, when Connecticut got its charter, Connecticut took over a New Haven colony. There were disagreements about uh, church discipline and such. And so there was, um, uh, as in the settlement of Newark, there was an effort to start over again and control uh, their, uh, uh, in almost a utopian way, control uh, 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 the aspects of life in, um, um, in this new land. So 1663 was the first effort, and it seems to have just kind of faded away. Uh, Stuyvesant did not reach the agreement with Oratan, and after a while, Stuyvesant wrote to Treat and the others saying, are you still interested? And then after a while, Treat stopped responding, and at that point, you know it's not going. I just wanted to note that for the person, the question before about Jersey City, um, that Clement Price Institute at Rutgers University in Newark is conducting a project now uh, with regard to Liberty State Park and history over there. So they can contact the Price Institute um, to get more information about the work that they're doing um, and the research they're doing and public engagement projects, as well as a, a lawsuit against Liberty State Park. And then the second thing was um, to also, I believe it's called the Dutch Institute online. They have different, different kind of research initiatives that they um, fund, and they have folks who have done some research um, on that area. So, um, but the Price Institute is really leading the way now for that region. Um, Jack Chen, uh, who, his cohorts are working with that, so they should their site. Uh, question from Diane Clark. Uh, were there free Africans living in the area at this time? And if so, what was the relationship between them, the Indians, and the settlers? Um, James, you can help me with this a little bit, but the, um, if I can stick to the 17th century, I can answer that. The 18th century gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, the Newark settlers, um, did not have enslaved, uh, who did not own enslaved persons. Um, although the first uh, recorded instance of a Newark resident uh, owning a slave is the will of Azariah Crane in 1721, right, James? And he was a teenager at the time that Newark was settled. His father, Jasper Crane, was one of the two um, 
um, uh, magistrates. Um, the uh, enslaved Africans were brought uh, uh, for the most part in the 1660s by Barba uh, planters um, uh, from Barbados. Um, John Barry, who, who bought, who got land um, kind of Lynnhurst North. Um, James, help me. I want to say that he had, he brought something like 12 or 15 or 20 enslaved, uh, what? 32 is even more than I remember. Um, 32 enslaved persons. Um, and um, William Sanford, who was across the river uh, in um, uh, what is now Kearney and Harrison, um, had, uh, had been the business manager for, um, uh, I think it's Nathaniel Kingsland. Uh, and the Kingsland had owned uh, the slaves in um, Suriname, um, had uh, lost them during a battle, the, the uh, second Anglo-Dutch trade war. Um, uh, Kingsland mostly remained in Barbados, but sent Sanford up here. And Sanford, um, uh, 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 it had enslaved people. There were enslaved people who were given in um, as marriage gifts between the Berry family and the Sanford family um, in the later 17th century. The in terms of um, uh, laws, uh, Noel, you can help me with this, but I think it was about 1683 that laws start appearing on New Jersey uh, from the General Assembly of New Jersey. Um, uh, referring to slavery to uh, both um, uh, uh, Negro slaves, which I think was the term used then, as well as Indian slaves. So there must have been some examples of, of um, uh, enslavement of Native Americans in New Jersey in the uh, uh, later, uh, by 1680. Again, I have not seen any reference to that for Newark. And you tend to get the reference in wills because um, uh, it was certainly evident in the Revolutionary War period when both patriots and loyalists were, were, were slave owners in Newark. And because enslaved people were an important, one of the most valuable, quote unquote, parts of a, a person's estate along with the house. And you don't see that in any of the wills uh, in 17th century Newark. You don't see, um, um, you don't even, you don't see indentured servants. Um, now there were indentured servants. So we, I've seen evidence of that in Elizabethtown. So presumably there were indentured servants in Newark as well. I just haven't seen that document. But by the 18th century, uh, yes, uh, uh, there are enslaved people in, in, in Newark, certainly. Um, less. Perhaps less so in the outlying farms, partly because they weren't they, they weren't wealthy enough for that. It was more of a town, um, than, at least as I understand it. Native American is bringing African American um, context. In the 1830s, there's a gentleman named Don Tinsman, um, and he is someone he was brought from Georgia um, as a young boy and to live here in Newark. And he actually ended up, he actually found the St. Philip's Church that used to be on yeah. Bay Boulevard. He married a white French woman, but he attended the Black Church um, and was a part of the Black community yeah. here. So that's kind of like that earliest, that's the only earliest evidence we have is during that 1830s, 1840s period. Also, Irene Patacom, who goes on to degree in work schools, her father, Ira Patacom, he was a uh, Native American, which was, um, and I think he might have come from the Staten Island area because there were a lot of Patacoms there. So that's really when you see any kind of Native American and um, free Blacks, uh, it's more in the 1970s. That's also a <laughs> So it's almost 7.30. You want to do one more question? We can do one more unless, James, you want to add to that. 
So Dan O'Flaherty has a follow-up to his question. Great. And I think he's trying to stump you a little bit, too. Um, um, so I'm how sure. would they know the market value of corn if there were no transactions where corn was traded for money? Um, so what was the market clearing price? Um, the uh, uh, To some extent, it was stipulated, and some of it, it would, they would say, you know, a bushel of corn is worth this and it's worth that. But I suspect that in New York, they got some sense of, um, of, um, uh, what was a clearing price for a bushel of corn or wheat or whatever else. Um, because even in this period, there was trade with Barbados. And so, uh, there would have been factors in, in, uh, me, uh, the, the merchants in New York and elsewhere who were putting together uh, ship loads of goods to, to send to, uh, uh, to Barbados. One of the other things that was sent to Barbados, and I don't know about Newark, but certainly Abraham Pearson and others in Brantford traded horses. They raised horses and traded those to Barbados in the uh, 1650s, 1660s. Barbados was by far the wealthiest, um, colony of that period. Of course, it was very much a slave based economy. I don't, but so Dan, we need to look at that. But I suspect that there was enough, there were enough transactions that you would get some sense of what a, an appropriate price. Is. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Nice presentation.